There is another element to the prosecution's case against President Trump in this, his second impeachment trial. Dramatic videos taken at the Capitol during the insurrection, hordes of rioters wreaking havoc, some chanting, fight for Trump. But who were the actual faces in that crowd? Ronan Farrow, contributing writer for The New Yorker magazine, profiled three different rioters to learn more about their backgrounds. All three were arrested and they now face criminal charges. Here's Ronan Farrow with our Michelle Martin explaining how one of the suspects even threatened him. Ronan Farrow, thank you so much for joining us once again. It's great to have you back with us. Always good to be here. So you've been digging into the backgrounds of some of the people who were part of the mob that invaded the Capitol. And you've actually done sort of a deep dive on a couple of them. So I just wanted to go one by one and ask you to say a few words about each. And then I want to see, you know, what the broader threads, you know, might be that bring them together. So why don't we start with Rachel Powell? You know, it's, it's always a point of controversy and a point of a lot of editorial discussion on my end, how you cover individuals accused credibly of domestic terrorism in a way that doesn't glorify but helps us mm -hmm. understand what are these problems and are we still going to be dealing with this in the years mm -hmm. to come. And you know the answer to that is almost certainly yes. And we can talk about some of the reasons why the, the root causes mm -hmm. of this are going to persist. Um, and these individuals that you mentioned each illustrate a different facet of that answer. For Rachel Powell, who you just mentioned, you know, she accords with data that is now emerging as people analyze these participants that suggests, yes, there were organized, coordinated groups involved with pre-planning. But also, there was a maybe significantly larger portion of this crowd that came with some degree of spontaneity without law enforcement or military training uh, and without any affiliation with a formal group. There was a University of Chicago study uh, just a few days ago that looked at a, a large subset of participants and, and found that uh, about 10% had some affiliation with a formal group. Now, uh, is that exculpatory? Absolutely not. It doesn't change the conduct of someone like Rachel Powell, who was smashing through windows with a makeshift battering ram and issuing orders to others through a bullhorn. But it is important to understand, because this is a, a genre of extremism. She is someone who uh, you know, is a self-described sports mom. Uh, a lot of her social media in years past was not political. It was just about organic food and yoga and, you know, very kind of mundane uh, interests that accord with what you'd expect of a, a mom of eight in a small town in Pennsylvania. And, you know, of course, she had some extremist leanings beforehand. She had some views that have been accentuated in the last year. But it really is in the last year that, uh, you look at her posts on social media and you talk to her now and you see someone who has gone full tilt into conspiracy theories and into extremism. So you were telling us that in your piece that Rachel Powell didn't even vote for Trump in 2016. And she was actually kind of lukewarm about him in 2020. So, so what happened that all of a sudden she was willing to, what, get on a bus or however she got there, go to the Capitol and start, you know, bellowing instructions through a bullhorn. What happened? She drove down with friends. More to the point, this is a central question that we're going to see analyzed during the impeachment proceedings. How much did Trump's words weigh in the minds of people who are accused of having committed violence that day? And you know, you see a spectrum when you talk to some of these individuals. Uh, for a number of people that I profiled and talked to, they very directly say, this was about loyalty to my president. I was obeying his orders, essentially. Uh, yeah. Rachel Powell, I, I think, is part of a, an equally important subset of these individuals to look at. She's someone who fancies herself fiercely independent. She likes the idea that she's anti-government. Uh, that's a thread that runs through this group and their extremist ideologies. Um, she... Uh, likes to flaunt the fact that she didn't vote for Trump that first time around, that she has criticism of some of his policies, like his environmental policies. Um, but, you know, when you scratch through the surface of that sort of defiant, I follow no one's orders ethos, um, she is someone who clearly loves Trump and his policies. You know, she talks about him being a brilliant businessman, how much he's benefited the economy in her view. Uh, she fully embraces his election fraud conspiracy theories uh, and, and seems to have really been led down that road, Michelle, by uh, a cohort of Trump supporters, especially Rudy Giuliani is someone she talked about a lot that she listened to very closely and who opened her eyes, as she puts it, to this world of falsehoods and conspiracy theories. 
And let's talk about Donovan Crowell. He, I think he fits the profile that I think a lot of people would have had. He's a 50 years old, former Marine, uh, served as a helicopter mechanic, you know, according to your reporting. He identifies as a member of, he does identify as a member of one of these militia groups, Oath Keepers and the regular militia. Tell me about him. What's his story? As you say, Donovan Crowell fits more of, uh, I think, what people see as the conventional mold for domestic terrorists. He is a part of an organized extremist group. Uh, he had been showing up along with others in this ragtag militia, uh, a, a mm -hmm. sub-chapter uh, of the Oath Keepers, essentially. There's an Ohio militia he's a member of, and then it's affiliated with this national group, Oath Keepers. Um, he had been showing up with them at uh, various events in his state in Ohio for months, uh, often armed and you know, fully kitted out in military attire. Um, you know, this is someone who is a veteran of no particular distinction, uh, you know, didn't serve in combat, um, but does say that he has PTSD, he struggles with addiction, um, you know, someone who very much fell off of the grid and fell into a rabbit hole of conspiracy theories as well, uh, you know, gradually alienating everyone around him. Th these are individuals whose family members helped turn them in in a lot of cases. Um, and you know, you talk to someone like Donovan Crowell, and, and you really understand why. Um, you know, he's someone who they're scared of him. Really, they, I think they're scared of him. You know, they talk about him being a marksman and fearing that he'll come for them or be violent. Um, they talk about him being erratic, uh, you know, allegedly due to his drug abuse. Um, and you, you sense that interviewing him. You know, he, he's someone who threatened me. Uh, you know, I've had security patrols outside uh, partly because of his threats and the fact that he's tied to a more credible, um, you know, larger group of extremists in the form of the Oath Keepers. So, so you've got Rachel Powell, who seems to be kind of a naif or maybe somebody sort of searching for something to believe in. And then you've got Donovan Crowell, who's, you know, what I think a lot of people would think would be attracted to this, the least, the last, the loss, you know, kind of broken not doing very well but then you get to larry brock who's the third person you profile uh air force academy grad lots of service medals small business owner early 50s what's that about and i should point out you know his medals are uh you know a a moderate level of distinction a lot of them are sort of participation medals that uh one would expect to have with the amount of time he spent in the service um so you know he's decorated but not highly decorated mm -hmm. uh, but but does represent a kind of middle of the road successful military profile who then went into the private sector and was also a uh, middle of the road successful you know he, he uh, was a pilot for a, a major airline for a time, uh, lives a very comfortable suburban middle-class lifestyle. Uh, and, you know, I, I thought that that was also important to draw out. You know, there, there were individuals there that day in that crowd who came on private planes. Um, this was not, as you just alluded to, just the downtrodden, the sad, the lost. Uh, there is an infrastructure, Michelle, uh, particularly online, that is setting about radicalizing a whole swath of different kinds of people. So let's talk about these these common threads. I mean, one is race. I mean, look, it's not it's no secret that most of the people there were white. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be mostly male, certainly not exclusively male. And you could tell that a lot of them were older. I mean, they weren't, you know, kids, you know, looking for something to do. They weren't teenagers, they weren't young adults. A lot of these were older. In fact, you alluded to this research at the University of Chicago that two researchers just published and folks can read it in the Atlantic. And they said, you know, of the 193 people who have been charged so far, the average age is 40. Two thirds of them are 35 or older and 40% are business owners or, or have white collar jobs. And, you know, those are some of the people that you, you profile. So, so what, What's the common thread here? I think there are a couple of commonalities that are worth looking at, but one of the most significant is the internet, is social mm -hmm. media companies in particular. Mm -hmm. and, and really, we're talking overwhelmingly about Facebook here. Mm -hmm. Each of these individuals, when I press them on where they got their news, you know, their, their misinformation, their convictions about election fraud, uh, their ideas about the, the COVID pandemic being, you know, overstated as a threat, they, you know, had to be sort of drawn into answering that question because I think a lot of them hadn't thought about where this came from. But ultimately, it came through Facebook. You know, 
Rachel Powell liked to say adamantly, you know, well, I don't follow any one single news source. Uh, you know, I don't look at the mainstream media. But when you drill down, what she's seeing is content that's coming at her on her Facebook feed. And that is a, a very difficult thing that we have to grapple with as a society. You know, I've talked to a lot of academic experts on radicalism, and they all point to that as a commonality. The fact that the algorithms built into Facebook are designed so that if you click extremist misinformation, it's going to send more of that your way. If you search for Rudy Giuliani, you're going to be sent down a whole rabbit hole, not of information about who Rudy Giuliani is that's accurate, but about Rudy Giuliani's worldview and some of the misinformation that he has peddled. And that's a very hard thing for us to break free of as a society. It is omnipresent and it's in the Facebook feeds of both, you know, ex-military guys who are looking for a new mission and, you know, a mom in rural Pennsylvania who is also feeling unmoored and has some bigoted and extreme views to begin with, um, but is, you know, sort of uh, a ripe target for this sort of thing. Okay, I want to dig into a couple of the things you just said. First of all, the racial aspect of it. Yes. Um, yes. You know, I know that, as you just said, a lot of these folks will go, I'm not a racist. Oh, my God. You know, I'm not racist. But it does seem that in some of their cases that this sort of this sort of either racial insecurity or racial animus does seem to be an animating force. I mean, I know with one of them in particular, uh, Donovan Crowell, I mean, his family members said that he was a stone cold racist and that he just was for some reason just really upset by black people. <laughs> but with the others, what about them? Like what role does kind of race play in their worldview or at least their susceptibility to this kind of um, messaging? You're exactly right that all of these individuals to varying extents are people of whom their family members said, you know, we've heard them say horrific racist things. And I've thought a lot about this question too. You know, it's striking talking to people who seem to have that kind of a history of racial views and hearing them explain it away. And, and it really sounds like a narrative they're feeding themselves. I can't be racist because I was nice to this one black person in my life. You know, each one of those individuals that you mentioned answered with questions about racism with some variant of, you know, I had a black boyfriend, I had a black girlfriend, I had a black. Yeah family member. Um, and I think in their mind, they sincerely feel that means they are not a racist. Now, what's interesting is when you then ask them about Black Lives Matter, to a one, they get very angry. Uh, they say, you know, well, that's very different. Uh, there was looting, there was destruction, uh, you know, that, that these are criminals, uh, you know, people who are protesting in, in those Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, and, and I think that gets at the nexus of these two factors. The social media infrastructure that is feeding uh, extremist content to people who are vulnerable to it, and uh, this undercurrent of racism that's being exploited by that infrastructure. And what a lot what of- What fascinates me, though, heard, though the, the contradictions is what, do they not see what they did at the Capitol as destructive? I mean, these, these are some of these guys wearing those blue lives. I mean, this is one of the jarring things for me is obviously many people have noted the Confederate flags being carried around through the Capitol and the just, but the blue lives matter flags, a lot of those guys are wearing blue lives matter patches. Meanwhile, they are viciously assaulting police officers, most of whom are white. And, I, and they severely injured many of them. I don't think that this has been adequately understood how many people have sustained severe injuries. We know that a number of people died. Like we know one person died soon after of his injuries. We know that at least one other person took his own life after the trauma of the event. But also there are dozens of police officers who are severely injured as a result of the conduct at the Capitol that day. I'm just wondering how they square that. I don't think it can be logically squared. I think that when you look at extremism and racism, uh, there are a lot of inherent contradictions that you have to swallow to come around to, to those kinds of abhorrent mm -hmm. views. And you know, the point I was going to make about the, the intersection between these two things is mm -hmm. it's not just that people with simmering racist views are ripe for exploitation by all of these structures that are designed to radicalize in the social media ecosystem. It's that the extremist content being funneled through that ecosystem is actually, I think, designed to 
accelerate and uh, ignite racism. Uh, specifically, uh, mm. experts who study extremism talk a lot about how that summer of protests where people sort of rose up and said enough about police brutality, et cetera, uh, that has been uh, processed by a far right wing machine. It has been excerpted and sliced up and videos showing moments of chaos uh, in those protests has been fed directly into these kinds of dark enclaves of the internet where extremism flourishes. A and so there is, a, I think, a real resurgence of not just you know, extremist conspiracy theories writ large, but specifically of racial animosity. So I really do feel like I have to go back to Donald Trump here. His second impeachment trial is, is commencing where he has been charged with inciting this mob, inciting the, the people whom you profiled and others presumably whom you will profile. And I just wonder what role did he play in their, in their lives? Um, thinking back to Rachel Powell, who says she wasn't particularly fond of him at the beginning, and was kind of lukewarm toward him, that she sort of cited as skepticism. But at some point, he became very important to her. And just what are your, what, what role does Donald Trump play in their lives and in this whole incident based on your reporting? Well, I think it's striking and illustrates how dangerous Donald Trump was and continues to be. He's still a figure in these circles that individuals uh, who have these views look up to. It, to look at that rapid uh, transformation in someone like Rachel Powell's views about Trump. You know, she came around to a very ardent embrace of Trump, I think, because of classic authoritarian tactics. Donald Trump really fed into this demographic and their minds, uh, you know, the othering of whether it's immigrants or black people, you know, a lot of racist dog whistles. Um, you know, the suspicions of uh, the legitimate pr free press. Um, you know, these, these are all hallmarks of how authoritarian leaders seize control, leaning into xenophobia, leaning into attacks on the press and on accountability and on truth. And you couple that potent cocktail of authoritarian tactics that has the power to bring around even people who were initially skeptical of him with the other population that we see represented here, people who really uh, responded to those uh, uh, tropes from the beginning and were all in on Donald Trump. Um, and you know, certainly that seems to be true of people like Brock, people like Crowell. Um, you know, they feel like they are in a pitched battle for the future of the country and the culture, and that Donald Trump uh, you know, is the legitimate leader of that battle. And you know they did talk about just following their president there and wanting to serve him. So you know this continues, I think, to be a powerful and, and troubling force in all of this. Donald Trump's role is not over. Ronan Farrell, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure.